Oh, hi, hello, welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm your host, Liv, here with more of the spookiest of spookies. Conversation edition. Today I spoke with one of the biggest names in ancient spooky, Daniel Ogden. He is a professor at Exeter in the UK, and we actually spoke because I had one of his PhD students on the show, Ryan Denson, to talk about all things sea monsters. You must remember that one from earlier this year. It was great. So when he suggested I speak with Professor Ogden, I was eager, not least because I own like four of his books and used my favorite one, the source book of magic and all things supernatural, not the official title, that's in the episode description, but I used it in so many month of this month's episodes, let alone the past spooky seasons that I've done. <laughs> so today we spoke about all things supernatural, werewolves and witches and dragons. We dived into it all and I am obviously very excited for you all to listen. One note is that we did record this shortly after I spoke with Ryan about sea monsters, so we're talking like March. So it's been a, a while, just to explain a couple things mentioned, but obviously I had to hang on to this episode until October because spooky. So sit back and enjoy all things spooky and supernatural. Conversations, dragons, witches, werewolves, the ancient supernatural with Daniel Ogden. So I would love to hear about really anything when it comes to the supernatural world in the ancient world, particularly, I think, like werewolves and witchcraft and and dragons as well so i mean I'll, I'll guide the conversation or i'm just happy to also have you talk so what interests you in this side of the ancient world because i do think it's kind of unique and different from from the more sort of the typical access points um i think it's just it's just me really <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, this, this is my kind of stuff uh I mean, I, I, uh, I mean, my, uh, when I started my graduate work, my, my research, it was in a very sort of sober, serious, well, <laughs> yeah, pretty sober, um, <laughs> serious uh, area. Uh, my PhD was actually on illegitimacy in ancient Greece. That was mm. the, that was the sort of, the, uh, I suppose, kind of fashionable sort of social historical um, subject in the, uh, in the, um, the late 80s, the early 90s, you know, when I was doing it. Um, and I, I, I enjoyed that uh, work, but um, I guess it wasn't really me, you know. <laughs> and what, uh, I mean, what I'd always loved since being a kid was um, uh, horror, um, certain, certain kinds of science fiction. Mm. Um, uh, and, uh, and, but the things that I, 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 lo I was particularly interested in was Hammer horror movies. Of course, I didn't get to see them until I was quite a bit older. Um, but even from being a small child, I was fascinated by you know, that, those particular versions of Dracula and Frankenstein and the mummy, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's it. So, uh, so, you know, I mean, the simple answer to, this, to your question is that uh, I'm just looking for that kind of stuff in the ancient world. I, I mean, and it's, that's something that's very fascinating to me as well. I... I mean, I sort of just appreciate horror generally. My version of loving horror is a lot of like slasher movies from the 90s and and weird things like that, supernatural. Um, and so basically, as soon as I found out that I could talk about werewolves in the ancient world, it was like a very, very big thrill for me. So, I mean, I think, and I hope it's all right that I want to start with werewolves. I know you're, you know, you're sure. most recently talking about dragons, um, but Werewolves are so interesting because I just kind of, I guess I had no real grasp that they, the concept of that was so ancient and, and like, why do you, I mean, why do you think that that existed back then? This idea of being transformed into a wolf as, I mean, I don't, I'm not phrasing a question very well, but I basically just want to hear more about <laughs> why yeah. you think werewolves happened in the ancient world. Well, it's, it is a good question, and I'm not, I'm not sure I have a, a definitive answer. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, but, I, I, I mean, it's often said that 
well, wolves are often regarded as, in a sense, the antithesis to man, mm. uh, as as man is the super civilized, um, the wolf is the super wild. I suppose I mean you could say that there are many animals that could be regarded as super wild. Mm. Um, so why why not talk about men turning into them instead? If you want to play with that that polarity, you know, mm -hmm. if you want to think about. Well, you know that that polarity between wildness and civilization. Um, they are, but I suppose I mean, wolves being fairly big animals are sort of almost kind of man-sized somehow. You can sort of understand, <laughs> as it were, the the transition between between the two. It's mm -hmm. a bit harder to think of, um, you know, the transition between a I don't know a man and a stoat, for example, isn't it? <laughs> you know, the sort of they're the right size. Um, but as I've suggested in the werewolf book, I think it's actually rather, it's not, not quite as simple as that. It's not just that wolves are super wild and, you know, humans are super civilized. Um, because if you think about it, um, and actually I think most people who are interested in wolves these days would think about it like, like this. In their own way, wolves are super civilized, mm -hmm. aren't they? I mean, they have their own, their own packs, their own communities, their own hierarchies. They're very cooperative um collaborative animals and of course they're basically they're basically doggies you know <laughs> and you know and uh, you know and, and indeed you know in the right circumstances are rather friendly uh, mm -hmm. animals. um so so I, again i i think that that's that's part of the mix too that there is already that there is already that sort of bridge there between man and wolf mm -hmm. um and again as, as i again as i do say say in the book uh, in a sense um a wolf is already a, in itself a werewolf because it does have mm -hmm. the wild aspect, but it also has the civilized man-like aspect, you know? So um, I think, so I think, I think that's the reason of choice. If, you, if you're thinking about what, what animals might a man turn into um, or what sort of problems might we think through, you know, um, with this sort of polarity between, between man and wolf. Uh, again, I do think the wolf sort of particularly lends itself to that, uh, to that to that sort of thinking mm -hmm. um, yeah uh, i mean there are i mean there i mean that that's 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 my basic take um mm -hmm. i think in fairness i should say that probably other people would probably give you other answers uh i mean one answer you might you might be given um would be that it's all to do with social organization mm -hmm. um and that there's an ancient tradition an ancient custom and sort of international almost universal i think um custom of of young bands of warriors being sort of conceptualized as wolf packs um, oh, interesting. and so and so this is this is basically the, the origin of it the as where the young man becomes the wolf to be this sort of to be this sort of marauding warrior and that's a phase he grows out of in due course so you have the man turning into the wolf and then returning from the wolf to to, to personhood, I suppose, manhood. Um, again, it's all. To, I mean, rights of transitions are in there somewhere. You know, the mm -hmm. idea that you go into, you temporarily visit an opposite status and then return from that opposite status um, to, tra to 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 transition. Um, so, I mean, a lot of people still believe that kind of stuff about mm -hmm. about werewolves. You know, um, I mean, there's, there's something in it. There's something in it, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I mean, I think, I mean, uh, I think, uh, I mean, we, we do have a bit of that in, 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 in the ancient world, uh, particularly in the case of Arcadia, it seems. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I mean, I think in, as far as the ancient world is concerned, the notion that um, young warriors are werewolves, that's, I think that's a sort of metaphorical development from an already existing sort of folk belief in werewolves. Mm hmm yeah. Well, it, it's interesting to me specifically because I focus so much on mythology broadly. And there's so much transformation in mythology, but there's something so different about the idea of transformation when it comes to werewolves. You know, like, I mean, mm. the gods are always transforming into animals to do various things, good and bad. Um, but the idea of, like, humans transforming in this much more like explicitly um, 
wild kind of way. Like when humans are the idea of a human transforming into a werewolf, it's like them becoming something else entirely versus the idea of a God transforming. And very much, I think we're to assume that, you know, when Zeus transforms into a swan, he's still Zeus. He just looks like a swan. Mm. Whereas werewolves are so different. It's much more, it feels like a, just like the, a fear in the human psyche of becoming a monster, I guess. Yes, although they're not, they're not again, they're not necessarily quite as different as as, as you would think. Um, mm. Yes, certain certain werewolf stories, yeah, um, entail that the, the the man transformed into a wolf is a real wolf, or you know, behaves like a wolf, and mm -hmm. obviously you have that with the, the Petronius werewolf story, if you know that, uh, mm -hmm. where the soldier having transformed starts attacking the flocks that uh, the militia keeps. Uh, and I suppose, I suppose the the werewolf um, latent in in the Aesop story again, who 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 is potentially going to devour the innkeeper, <laughs> um, uh, is also is also of that sort. But then again, if you go back to the Arcadian material, um, mm -hmm. uh, again the the belief is that again these young men having uh, they transform into wolves for a, a fixed time. Before they can recover their, their I say their, their, their personhood, um, but there's this notion that if they abstain from human flesh within that time, uh, sorry, well, well, the notion is that if they abstain from human flesh within that time, then they are able to transform back um, mm. uh, to, to to being human again. So that, um, and I think the the assumption is that in fact they all do. <laughs> um, okay. So that that. Uh, that sort of builds a picture of a werewolf who is actually um, rather civilized werewolf. I mean, still a man mm. inside, as it were, uh, with or with some degree of human consciousness, um, and that and that sort of ties in very neatly with the earliest medieval werewolves. You know, so there's a, so after about 400 BC, when when um, Augustine is talking about werewolves, after that there's a kind of gap, you know, of uh, of uh, 800 years or so until we start hearing about werewolves again and typically in, in well for first in French and Norse sources um, and in those in the, in the French sources again th those were those werewolves are sort of unfortunate men transformed into wolves but still retaining their their, their, their human consciousness inside mm. um, so again there's there's not much emphasis on that on in in the the ancient sources which are mm quite sparse as, I, as i'm sure you realize um mm -hmm. but i think again cert certain ones of them do do entail the notion that the the man transformed into the wolf is still a, is still a man and can behave you know in a fairly civilized way mm -hmm. i think that just makes it so much more interesting like the idea that there are so many different variations on mm. what it is actually like to be a werewolf in in whatever way that that there are these like not options but these alternatives where where you're either monstrous or just a person in a wolf it really adds to the just the fascination that that the stories were really developed in the first place that they they have these all different types and and you know span so sure. many different generations and you know and centuries and things yes i agree there's there's, there's no there's no sort of one fixed pattern even in the ancient world mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know i mean each each werewolf seems to each werewolf case seems to be a little bit different you know, mm -hmm. yeah yeah i agree i just love the idea of these things um you know crossing time so much and just staying in the realm of imagination in all these different ways because even today you have stories of werewolves that are good or bad or or a little bit in between and and sure. just the idea that 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 the story is that old is, is so exciting <laughs> yeah yeah just the idea that that uh that the ancient world, while they were, you know, so involved in in mythology and everything, but then had had all these sort of separate and much more human ideas of of transformation and and generally like the supernatural, I suppose, in general, um, is really just broadly interesting to me. One of the other um, books of yours that I love to use, which I realize is probably like a different. Um, I don't know how it goes writing these things, but the the source book that you have on oh. just generally magic and everything sure. is has been such a wealth of information for me because just the idea that that witches and witchcraft and magic and the supernatural broadly uh, is is utilized in so many different ways is really interesting. Um, 
And again, I'm trying to find a question within that statement. But I suppose, you know, well, actually, you know what? One thing that that really interested me, I spoke to somebody uh, last year about this, is the differences between um, the the ancient Greek ideas of witches and witchcraft and the Roman. Because sure. to me, this is speaking broadly, but they feel very distinct. You know, we have yeah. women like Circe and Medea, and then we have sure. women like... Um, Oh, I'm going to forget her name, but the... Well, Canidia, Erykso, yes, exactly. they would be the obvious ones. Meroe, yes. Anaphilaeus, they'd be the obvious ones to mention. Yeah, yeah Canidia is who I was thinking of specifically, but but all of those I've, uh, you know, researched. This was a, a while back now, but but the, they're such distinct types of characters. And it seems to me that the Greeks really found like a, almost like a more positive interest in the idea of these kind of characters, mm-hmm. whereas the Romans felt the need to make them like, a bit more either ridiculous or dangerous or or just it's very it's interesting the differences do you have thoughts on what that comes yes from? uh yeah i mean well i think actually greek witches uh and actually i mean i know evidence for greek witches is, is really quite limited it's it's mm-hmm. not much more than the traditions of circe and medea and there's a whole bunch of people out there who don't think circe is even a witch anyway <laughs> but um <laughs> Uh, yes, I think, well, I think the big difference in the end is that, yeah, Roman witches tend to be old hags Mm -hmm. and and tend to be, well, I've used the word gothic. It's a bit of a vague word, isn't it? Going back to my Hammer Horror days, really. (laughs) (laughs) They they tend to have a sort of gothic atmosphere. Um, They're they're bloodthirsty. They're particularly Mm -hmm. bloodthirsty and... Uh, involved with body horror and things like that, you know. But you know, I mean, we should we shouldn't sort of let our eye leave the ball on this. I mean, the Greek Greek witches are can be pretty bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, let's not forget that Circe seemingly transforms all visitors to her island into animals. And um, I mean, let's just think this one through. Um, she turns obviously famously Odysseus's crew into pigs and herds them into styes. Now, what's that about? What's that far? If, if, for, I mean, she's not just keeping them as pets, I think. You know, I mean, there's only one thing pet, sheep you can keep for wool, mm. cows you can keep for milk, chickens you can keep for eggs. There's only one purpose of a pig in a farm, and that's to be eaten. Mm. So she's planning to eat them. Right, so that that already makes, you know, we think of sexy Circe, but that already makes her look a, a whole lot worse, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. And we can go further than that. Um, I think the indications are that every animal on the island is a human being that's been transformed. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not immediately apparent when when uh, when we first hear about the wolves and the uh, the wolves and the lions. That's the wolves and lions that surround her house. But, late, but later on in the text, it does become clear that those also are transformed human beings. Mm-hmm. Now, if you think back again, before Odysseus has actually even seen, I think, Circe's house, or at least anyway, certainly approached it, he's found this big stag, which he's, mm-hmm. which he's shot, and he's taken back to his crew at the, at the beach, and they've eaten it. Mm-hmm. So not only is Circe eating people, she's tricking perfectly innocent people, people into cannibalism so Mm -hmm. you know so she is pretty much a monster and then to turn to Medea I mean let's not forget that Medea's first significant act really is is to um well yeah I mean first significant well after after the 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 the, uh the gold fleece episode itself her first significant act is actually to murder her own brother and chop him up into little bits (laughs) yeah Um, (laughs) and uh and again again you know, uh, sort of modern perspectives on the Medea play really, you know, have a lot to answer for. Even though she's murdering her children, she comes across as really sympathetic to us, doesn't she? Mm-hmm. You know, and she's, I mean, you, you would say that within ancient Greek myth, she's almost like a feminist icon. You know, I mean, she, you know, she, you know, she, you know, she takes on a, uh, um, a cheating husband and, uh, and uh, sorts him out, doesn't she? <laughs> but, <laughs> But yeah, uh, I do, you know, but uh, one has to uh, um, imagine, I think, that an ancient audience would have, would have, uh, you know, they certainly, 
certainly one has to be sympathetic to a certain extent to Medea in the play. There's, there's mm-hmm. very little interest in it if, if, if one isn't sympathetic to her. But I think you know those those that that child murder at the end has to figure rather large, more 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 largely, <laughs> you know, in the ancient imagination of her and the judgment of her um, mm-hmm. than it does for us. Um, so they're pretty bad. Um, <laughs> They are, but they're complex. That's what's so interesting about them is like they're bad, but their their bad has complexities. Because even Cersei, like she transforms all these people. The implication is to eat them, absolutely. But you can also see a way in which she's doing it as protection for herself and her island. You know, she sees these mm-hmm. people as a threat, and while that's not a good way of necessarily handling a threat, you can see maybe where she's Mm. coming from and i feel similarly with medea like less so about her brother um but with the children in euripides like euripides really sets it up as though you can see her thought processes where she's like going through everything that has happened to her all of her options as this woman who is not greek um who is living in Mm. corinth and and really has minimal options when Jason decides to leave her sure. because she and her children will have nothing. They'll just be like thrown out. And and so you can almost see that again, like this is not, you know, a, a decision that is that we're meant to think is a good one, but you can see how she gets there where she almost feels like it's a kindness to her children versus having them with her just like left out in the dust because of jason and so like in both cases that's what interests me where you know they do bad things absolutely there's no like redeeming their actual actions but you can see where they're coming from whereas Mm -hmm. with the roman and i'm not as familiar with the roman i'll admit but they feel a lot more just like almost not not necessarily comedically but like over the top evil over the top bloody and gory and over and just like bizarre almost yeah um yes and uh, uh uh yes i mean there's a little well i was going to say there's little attempt to give canidia much of a backstory or to make her to make her sympathetic um mm-hmm. although um uh i mean there's quite a lot of humor i suppose sardonic humor in one of horace's poems about her the, the one in which he claims to have been subject to her binding love magic Mm. Arikso too, Lucan's Arikso, you know, this great sort of necromantic witch. Mm-hmm. Um, again, she's not completely one-dimensional. Uh, there are a couple of there are a couple of little touches in that in that you know, as you would, as you would say, bizarrely over the top portrait that I like. One mm. is that uh, when Sextus Pompey first seeks her out to perform a, a reanimation for him, um, or at least a, a, some sort of divination, it turns out to be. A, a, uh, uh, a reanimation. Um, you know, he 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 tells her these. He's you know he's sort of right because you know he's heard that she's the best, and mm. she's she's clearly flattered. She's clearly touched by that. You know, so there's that little, little very human element to it. Um, mm-hmm. And then also when she's threatening the gods in order to get um, them to make the ghost re-inhabit the body so that she can reanimate the corpse. One of the threats that she makes is to expose the goddess Hecate before mm. the other gods without her makeup on. Oh, um, you know, that's <laughs> what sort of a threat is that? I mean, it's all about, it's all about the, the, the like, the, I don't know, the, 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 hor- the, the horrors of, of, uh, of um, petty bourgeois, you know, middle age, isn't it? I mean, it's, yeah. you know, what, what, but it's, but, it, but it's humour, isn't it? Because it's just, it's just yeah. humour. It's, it's just, Lots of humour there. So, again, Erikto is a complex figure. Um, but I've recently argued again. Again, this is quite a this is probably quite an obscure book. So you may not, and it's a little, just a little book. You may not have seen it. Um, mm-hmm. I also have, I've also probably recently published something called the Strix Witch, um, mm-hmm. and um, this is a little book, just about thirty thousand words, on that phenomenon. Um, and that phenomenon, phenomenon, to be brief, is a phenomenon of old women who transform themselves well who fly by night either by transforming themselves into owls or by some sort of soul projection Uh, and in either owl form or soul form they penetrate a domestic house um, 
there's usually some sort of issue as to how they get past the door. But they, you know, that's the challenge. Um, and they attack babies within, either stealing the baby or attacking the baby, stealing organs from the baby, sometimes surreptitiously stealing organs from the baby so you don't realize they're stolen, mm. and then getting out again. Uh, leaving the baby to sort of, well, either leave, leaving the baby dead or to fail slowly. Um, so that's quite a, that's quite a phenomenon. And um, mm-hmm. we get that in, we get, we get, um, as the classical authors, we get Ovid and Petronius talking about these witches. Um, and uh, what they say is sort of nicely amplified by some medieval sources, which, which I, I won't go into. Um, but I think, I mean, that's a, that's, that, that was a distinctive phenomenon in Roman culture. That was mm-hmm. kind of like the Roman answer to the Greek child killing demon, the Lamia. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I mean, I, I mean, the fun, I mean, what the function of that sort of folk belief, so the, the strict switch, um, is clearly, I think, to to account for, you know, mass infant mortality. Mm-hmm. You know, um, if every other child is going to die within a few weeks of being born, you know, you need an explanation for it, don't you? But anyway, I think I think that that idea, the notion of this strict which is quite distinctive phenomenon, um, is what imbues the portraits of witches in um, in uh, in Latin literature, in, in the poetry mm-hmm. and the prose, and Apul- Apuleius too. Um, I think there's I think that is what sort of gets into the mix there, and that's why they're suddenly witches are all suddenly like old and bloodthirsty. I think mm-hmm. they're basically they've all been strixified, even if they're not specifically designated as strixes on an individual basis. Hmm. That's really interesting. I it sort of connects with what I had sort of, of, of thought of the Roman, the Latin uh, witches, which is they also witches and comma which is uh, that they also sound like a bit of a commentary on women and just the opinions of these writers and the culture on on women broadly because mm. i mean even just the idea of of the a threat of like revealing a goddess without makeup on doesn't seem like something that a woman would ever write you know it very much <laughs> feels like <laughs> like a man writing about a woman and i find that that very interesting i think it it says something about their like mindsets um well Yes, possibly. I suppose, yes, I suppose it's a man recognising a peculiarly feminine anxiety. I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and 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 blowing it blowing it up big, isn't it? Yes, it, well, I suppose, yes, it's hard, to be fair, it's hard not to look at these Roman portraits of witches um, uh, and not think of them as being misogynistic. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, you know, yeah, and that's fair enough. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to resile from that. Um, but one point I would want to make is that this concept of the strict witch in itself, which is, which is influencing these portraits, uh, I'm not sure that the concept of it in itself is misogynistic. Hmm. Even though even the, you're, 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 you're painting a picture of a distinctively female monster, a kind of anti-mother monster. Mm-hmm. Um, again, what is the social function of believing in strict witches or in, as a, on the Greek side in child-killing demons? I think it is to explain um, otherwise inexplicable infant mortality. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and it seems to me, and if and if a strict switch or a child killing demoness, Lamia, uh, is not is is not going to get the blame for a child dying, who is going to get the blame for a child dying? Mm-hmm. Um, isn't it better? Isn't it better to be blaming child killing demons and and child killing witches than to be than to be executing young mothers who've mm-hmm. just lost their babies? 
you know so I mean, <laughs> very true so I think it's, you, know, you know i think it's a i think it's a you know it's not as not quite as cut and dried as it thinks you know uh, as sorry, as it as it seems um mm -hmm. and uh sometimes these these sorts of belief can can actually um work in women's favor uh and not not always not always to their to the detriment and indeed i would say that i mean probably who who thinks more about in, who who in ancient society cares most uh frets most is most anxious about infant mortality i would suggest it is the mothers in fact mm -hmm. so probably these ideas these ideas of uh, say strict switches and and child killing demons probably originate i would say and sort of belong with women themselves in the first instance mm -hmm. So again, so I'm a bit I'm a bit reluctant to, to just to just to just to say in a sort of very reductive way this is a misogynistic idea. Yes, it's it's, it's an idea that we may well find being used mis misogynistically in our in our in our male authors. That's the thing. It sounds like a little bit of of everything. Um, because I mean, certainly, I mean, even just the idea of if 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 babies are dying, if there is an issue with infant mortality and you have to explain it via a supernatural source, like it seems obvious that that source would be feminine. It, that certainly, you know, just sort of fits the bill. Um, but then I, I think it's, it's similar, you know, you can have those ideas that are, that are based in, in not misogynist ideas that are just based in, in sort of like the more obvious choice um, that then can get transformed into more misogynist ideals. Like when it comes to the Latin authors who are, who are sort of having a lot of fun with these characters and, and, you know, inventing their own versions, certainly. But that's very sure. interesting. The idea of uh, the connection with Lamia as well, because I, I mean, I suppose I, I, I'm just constantly fascinated by the the explanations that the ancient people had to to account for tragedies and or just you know phenomena like like babies dying you know unexpectedly and and the idea that that uh, the uh, concept of a of a child killing demon or a this witch you know is invented to sort of account for that is is interesting and 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 certainly refreshing that it doesn't mean that immediately the mothers are going to be blamed for, you know, killing an heir or something. Sure, exactly. Yeah. It's it's fascinating to me that that I guess you know, witches in in ancient Greece then didn't get the same designation. Like they had these very distinct ideas. And and Lamia too, like, you know, she she doesn't appear in a lot of, of strict mythology, more of like this the folk idea, like you're mentioning. Yes. Yes. which has always interested me uh, because she's an interesting character and sometimes she's one person and sometimes she's like a concept sure. of these like demon characters. Um, but I suppose the other thing that, that occurred to me as well is it, Circe and Medea, the, the most famous, if not the only Greek witches, are also explicitly divine in a way that the Roman witches seem much more, not necessarily mortal explicitly, but like down to earth for lack of a better mm. term oh sure yes yeah mm -hmm. um yeah i mean there are, you, you have to really scrape around for for uh shall i say ordinary witches in the greek world i mean mm -hmm. i suppose we have the historical example of theoris who was mm. uh, a, a, you know again a woman accused of witch of witchcraft in classical athens um and lucian lucian uh, again, mm -hmm. second century AD, going going quite late now. Greek author mm -hmm. does 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 have some some witches talking together, or or, or, or rather some courtesans talking about a witch, I should say. Um, mm. They can use um, uh, again. One might think they live in the same world to a certain extent, um, but, mm -hmm. but yes, it's yes, it's pretty hard. It's pretty hard, and of course, there's always the problem of Simitha. You know, I mean, Simitha. Mm. Um, uh, again, many people I think would argue that Simitha is not a witch, but she's sure, she's surely pretending to be a witch very hard, isn't she? I don't think I'm familiar with her. Oh, you're not familiar with Simitha? Oh, well, oh, well, that's, oh, no, or if I am, I've forgotten. <laughs> right. Oh, well, yeah. So this is um, Theocritus' second idyll. So you know, Hellenistic, mm. Alexandrian literature oh. around about two seven five mm. some BC, something like that. Um, oh, it's a wonderful book. It's about a hundred lines, is it, uh, or so? Um, a very elaborate monologue. 
by this young young woman. She's, she's a young woman, mm -hmm. I think, um, who has acquired a boyfriend, Delphis. Um, she said she was a virgin beforehand, um, but he's been with her for a few days or a few weeks, and he's suddenly disappeared. He's not he's not coming around anymore. Um, um, and with the help of her maid, so she's clearly not a completely destitute woman. I don't know what her she seems to live on her own with her maid, but don't know what her don't know what her source of income is. Um, but together mm -hmm. they are um, uh, concocting concocting a very elaborate love spell to get him back. Mm -hmm. um, and we hear about all the details of this love spell as, as, as she speaks. Um, and she's throwing everything at him. So all sorts of love magic of, a, of sorts that you would never find together in the same place usually. Everything is thrown together in this kind of haphazard way, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, with a, you know, with a, you know um, if a little is good, a lot is better principle. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it's, I, I, again, you know, in some ways, you know, it seems as though she knows a lot. You know, she's, you know, she has a lot of expertise about love magic. You know, when you line up what she's doing with the Greek magical papyri and, and other other literary texts, well, possibly, but it's it's also possible that her knowledge is kind of superficial, and you know, she's just as, mm -hmm. a, as it were, sort of play. You know, she's an amateur playing the game as best she can, um, mm -hmm. but. Whatever she is, I mean, I think nonetheless, it's uh, that 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 poem is splendid evidence for for witchcraft, you know, and ideas mm -hmm. about witches, you know, whether Simitha herself is actually a witch or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I realized as soon as you started describing it, it's been recommended to me, so it's on my list of two reads. Right. So I'm glad to have that description. Yeah, it, is as in, well. it is in the source book actually, so uh, you don't need to go very far to. Oh, great. It. <laughs> perfect that source book is so big i've made my way through like certain chunks of it for episodes but there's always more to get through so one thing that uh that ryan mentioned when we were speaking about sea monsters and the thrill of those um uh, is he was mentioning you know ideas of dragons uh and the connection to the real world but i'm curious about just because dragons feel so um separate i suppose from from real life in a way that, you know, as we were discussing sea monsters, you can really see where they're getting the idea of sea monsters from just a lack of knowledge of what exists within the sea and what they can, sure. you know, discover about it. Um, but dragons, you know, specifically like Apollo and Delphi yeah. and, and that situation feels so separate. So I'm just curious about the connections between real things. Yes, um, that is a good question. Um, I think the first thing to say is that the ancient Greek word for dragon is draco, uh, mm -hmm. and that goes into Latin as draco, and then I suppose English gets it through medieval French probably um, as dragon. Um, but mm. draco didn't mean quite the same thing as dragon does to us. Mm -hmm. um, draco basically means a jolly big snake <laughs> um, uh, with, uh, and uh, well, this is my sort of the definition that I've come come to use for it over the years, um, a, a big snake and something more. Um, mm. And that something more is where usually there's a sort of supernatural dimensional context to it. Um, or sometimes the more can be much more sort of crudely physical, you know, an extra part. So, for example, many dracontes are, are portrayed on Greek vases with beards, hu human style mm. beards um for example um uh or they're often sort of compounded into with, with other animals to make you know make um compound monsters of of, of, ver of various sorts um so mm -hmm. obviously kerberos has a has a dragon tail and dragon hair people don't often realize that and dragon, dragon hair I um, love his dragon mane his little snakes in the mane yes, exactly <laughs> exactly yes and uh yeah. obviously you know medusa has the there's a dracontes on her head the chimera has mm -hmm. this dracon tail um mm -hmm. um so yeah but 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 a dra but i say but a, a dracon could just be a big snake I say, and the minimum sort of requirement is a kind of supernatural context. Um, and mm -hmm. so the serpents of Asclepius, for example, were dracontes. Mm. Um, and right. um, there is evidence, and you've got to work hard with it, but there is evidence for the maintenance of 
actual snakes. Um, if uh, if your listeners are herpetologically minded, uh, they were probably four-lined snakes, a variety of rat snake. Um, there is evidence for them being maintained in, in temples um, mm. uh, where, they, where they were used as a uh, as sleepy, as sleepy temples and other healing temples where they were used as part of the part of the healing process and um, mm -hmm. you know uh, would be invited to lick or kiss the patients um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah well I guess it affects different people in different ways doesn't it <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I quite like it myself I think but uh, well I mean four line, four line snakes are, are, are harmless and actually um, well, I think I think friendly would be the wrong word, but I've seen them described as phlegmatic. They don't mind humans mauling them, you know. So, um, but uh, but anyway, so 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 there is a sense in which you know dracontes, some kinds of dracontes were were real animals, very much part of not not necessarily everyday life, but part of real life, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it's really just a matter of you know. Just imagining uh, how far though, how far the dracone that you know—I won't say in love, but the dracone that you know—how how far that idea can be stretched. You know, what other varieties of it mm. might there be? Have there been? You know, so um, yeah. Um, and then in terms of like sort of more monstrous, um, uh, fantastical creatures i mean dracontes and, and others uh again one of the mm -hmm. one of the um i'm sh i'm sure um that um this must be a big book for you as it is for me um adrian Mayor's first fossil hunters um mm. in fact i have to say if you're looking if you're looking for recommendations to come on your podcast i would put her number one <laughs> and, on uh, that, that is <laughs> i mean a, a, a splendid fascinating book and she's a splendid communicator as well um, mm -hmm. And um, one of the amazing things that I learned from that book is that I'm trying to think of I'm trying to think of I want to say primeval, but that's a bit of a that's a bit of a broad word. Um, well, pre, let's just say prehistoric mega fauna mm. fossils. Um, I'm right. sure there's a better word than that, but anyway, um, were found in the archaeological remains of the. Temple of Hera on Samos, the great Temple of Hera on Samos. You know, mm. um, I'm not sure whether it's specifically one of these um, uh, mega giraffes that used to exist, but anyway, something like that. So anyway, so the bones of a mm. of a massive, strange creature, um, and you've got to ask, right. how did they get there? You know, mm -hmm. so clearly, some ancient Greek at some point dug these out of a hillside somewhere or found them lying around and you know said well this is a these are the bones of something pretty amazing pretty special um uh, uh and you know all sorts of stories could be could be spun around it so i'm sure on some occasions bones like this were the bones of great dracontes from the past on other occasions they would be identified as human bones i suppose again we hear about you as you're probably aware we, we hear all sorts of stories about the discovery of the bones of heroes and heroes were imagined to be supersized so that works you know mm -hmm. um and then given special special treatment um but again but but what what is going on in, in your mind if you're again if you're living in the ancient world and you don't have a, you, you know you're not a um you're not a darwinian you know you don't have a concept <laughs> of you know of uh, the, as it were the historical dimension of these creatures you know mm -hmm. for you the earth is always pretty much always going to have been as it is now so what has how do these creatures mm. fit into it there you are i mean there is your proof there is your incontrovertible incontrovertible evidence that monsters of the sort that you hear about in myth did exist if they don't exist now they mm -hmm. did exist you know um so uh mm -hmm. yeah um uh so uh, uh yes yeah, so i don't think it's too hard really for the it was too hard for the ancient greeks to to make um, these Tricontes real for themselves. Right. I I'm, love the idea of, of finding some kind of bones and then coming up with the idea for the Chimera because it's one of my favorite creatures. It's just so bizarre. Right. And 
certainly it could have also just been imagination based on on other things that they'd found but i just like the idea of them finding some bones and being like well i think this is a lion but maybe there's also a goat's head and and a snake involved <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah i mean the goat i mean the goat is the tricky part isn't it and of course it's yeah I mean, in a sense the goat is the indispensable part because chimera means goat so it's almost like it started with the goat and the the the, the, <laughs> the other bits of it that. which look more useful <laughs> <laughs> like the lion yeah. and the snake, they 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 may be, they may be the 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 optional extras, um, mm-hmm. but I mean, I, I get, well, of course, I'm always promoting um, and urging the importance of Dracontes, um, but I do think, mm-hmm. I mean, having having mentioned the Chimera, I do think um, the dragon, although it's just a tiny bit, it's just a tail, as, as with Kerberos, mm. although it's only a tiny sort of proportion of the monster in many ways it's the most important part and it's kind of like the business end because mm-hmm. why is the chim- the chimera terrible because it goes around burning everywhere up it's a fire breathing monster yeah. it goes around laying waste to landscapes um how does it have the capacity to breathe fire well that has mm-hmm. to come even if it's breathing fire out of its lion mouth not its snake mouth. That ability has to come from the the snake element. It seems to me because uh, uh, again, the notion that I should, I should perhaps I should have studied somewhere else here. The notion that drag, ancient dragons breathe fire, and that's very, very firmly established already in the ancient world. That is clearly mm. um, in an ancient context an imaginative extrapolation of of um, of viper venom, you know, which is which which which, which oh. induces a burning sensation. I'm sure, I don't doubt at all oh. that's where that's why dragons breathe fire because they're like big vipers um, yeah. and so the chimera, to go back to the chimera breathes fire because it has that snake tail mm-hmm. um, Kerberos similarly I would say, I mean again one of the lesser mm-hmm. myths of Kerberos but my, my personal favourite is that when Heracles dragged him out of the underworld Bear in mind, he'd been mm-hmm. born in the underworld. He'd never seen daylight before. Mm-hmm. So, um, big tough dog as he was, he was terrified. And what and what does a terrified dog do? He threw up. <laughs> and he he threw up on an, on a harmless plant called the aconite, and his vomit or his slather transformed that plant into the most supposedly the most poisonous plant of the ancient world, the aconite. Um, again, so where is that venomousness coming from? Again, it has to be not mm-hmm. his doggy element, but his snake element. Mm-hmm. And then if we go to Medusa again, uh, what is her sort of, you know, USP, her characteristic, you know, weapon? Of course, as you know, it's mm-hmm. freezing people, isn't it, uh, into stone. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not true, apparently, but there is this widespread folk belief very very widespread international folk belief that snakes hypnotize their prey before eating them mm. and freeze freeze their prey um right. and i think it's pro- probably often the case that a rabbit seeing a snake just just does in fact freeze as a sort of defense mechanism mm. to avoid being seen um especially snakes sort of see movement more easily than um you know fix things um but anyway there is that belief and it seems to me that the reason that Medusa and the Gorgons can can freeze people into stone is because that's again that's another snake capacity that's been mm-hmm. you know built up, magnified and built up. So although snakes are a sort of relative, relatively small proportion of these three monsters, as I say, I think they're they're the key bit really. They're the, they're the they're the things that give them their their killer their killer qualities. You know? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I wonder too about like paralytical qualities of snake venom. I don't know enough, but it it seems to me that that could be connected to Medusa as well. Oh yes, but that, actually that's a good point. Yes, because snake venom, I think yes, it can it can it can paralyze, can't it too? So yeah, so that may well be part of the story. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Uh, I'm curious about um, the myths that involve the planting of the teeth afterwards. Sure. And I know that that comes from like. Autochthony and just you know being born of the earth, yeah. but in terms of the snake value, is there anything there? Uh, I don't. I don't know if there's anything distinctively snaky about that. Mm-hmm. Um, it is weird, isn't it, um, that we get this mm-hmm. um, this 
motif in two different places. We both get it in Thebes mm -hmm. when Cadmus has killed uh, the dragon, the dragon of Ares, mm -hmm. and then we get it again over in Colchis. Um, mm -hmm. They're two very different examples. Like they're ones like growing the new Thebans to help Cadmus, yeah. and then one is like the people that Jason has to fight. So I find that interesting as well that they're very distinct in terms of like the function of the people yes. that grow. Well. Yeah, I mean, well, again, they're both warriors. They're both bunches of warriors, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And actually, Cadmus does have to deal with mm -hmm. the, the Theban spot sewn men. Um, mm. He, he again, he has to throw this stone in amongst them so that they start fighting themselves. I mean, I suppose the notion is right. that they fight him otherwise. So maybe it's maybe it's not right. quite so different. Um, mm -hmm. But um, and, and, but we are told actually that when Athene gathered up the, the teeth for Cadmus to sew, get, sorry, mm -hmm. I mean, gather the teeth out of the the jaws of the dragon of Ares. She kept half of them back and gave them to Yeti. So it's so so those so those those um stone warriors over right. in Colchis are I mean they come from the same place. Um I, about that. Uh, I mean well I'll say something more about no no I'll say I'll, I'll talk about Thebes first. Um right. <laughs> one thing that interests me about that particular story is mm -hmm. that um there are different traditions about Cadmus. Cadmus is attributed with discovering or inventing a lot of different things, including alphabets. Mm -hmm. He's also credited with the discovery of metal and the invention of mining. Mm. Now, bear, now think about that in connection with um, uh, with uh, well, two facts. Normally, normally he is said to have killed the dragon with a stone. Mm. Um, and then, of course, the sewn men famously grow out of the ground, already wearing arms. Mm -hmm. And I can't help feeling mm -hmm. that that is another way of telling the story of Cadmus's discovery of metal. He kills mm -hmm. the snake with a stone because metal doesn't yet exist. But then the teeth are sewn, the warriors spring up, and there they are wearing armour. There is metal. There is metal coming out of the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so, in other words, so somehow that metal comes from the body of the dragon which is interesting again you do, one tends to think about the metallicness of of snake skin then but mm -hmm. um but then going over to colchis mm. it is weird it is weird that well, why, why should half of these teeth be held mm -hmm. back and then given to eets um it just doesn't really make sense um so i mean the um uh, I mean, the order of things as we have it. Oh gosh, as I, as I recall, in um, in in uh, Apollonius's Argonautica, is mm -hmm. yeah. So for the first trial that Jason has with Aetes is to sow the teeth. No, sorry, sorry. Yes, mm -hmm. is to is to, to yoke the fiery bulls, with which which he then uses to sow the teeth, the snake's teeth, the, teeth. the dragon's teeth into the ground. Then the armed men grow up. And then he has to fight the armed men. Then he mm. goes on to deal with the the dracone, the dragon, another dracone that guards the golden fleece. Now I have to say, it would make much more sense, wouldn't it, within the Colchis story, if he dealt with the dragon first, and then those armed men derived not from the teeth of some strange Theban dragon all the way over there, but from the teeth of the Colchis dragon. Uh, and mm -hmm. I must admit, I, I'm very tempted to believe that there was this thing, this thing, the mythical lost version of the story, which I was talking about. Mm -hmm. There was a lost version of that story in which the the, the episodes happened in a different order. Um, and mm -hmm. um, so Dragon first, and, Dragon, and Jason would obviously have to, would have had to kill it, I suppose, uh, rather than it just being sort of drugged by Medea. Um, uh, and then the teeth come from the dragon. And are then sewn, and at that point, uh, Jason has to has to uh, fight the um, fight the armed warriors, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is exactly actually what happens in the uh, nineteen sixty three movie in Jason and the Argonauts. Mm -hmm. Again, Ray Harryhausen changes that all around, and and to, to, to give it a much better a much better logic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those great skeleton men. Exactly. I mean, there. Yes. Yes, again, it's, it's, it's important to, yes, it is important. I'm, I'm afraid rather 
soberly and disappointingly to remind your your listeners that those skeletons they belong to Ray Harryhausen and that the original stone men are just I'm afraid rather boring ordinary men. I know it's too bad because the skeletons are incredible. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. I because there's also we have that po pottery of Jason like being spit out of the dragon too, yeah. right? So it, it it certainly seems to suggest there's there's a different tradition there, especially because Apollonius is writing so late, and we know that the general idea of the story of of the Argonautica and the quest and everything is much older. But most of the details we have are are from the Hellenistic period. So well, I agree. Yes, I mean for me, one of the big mysteries actually. Um, of mm. ancient Greek literature and myth is where was the original Argonautica? Where, mm. where, where did that brilliant, brilliant story? Um, where was it originally kept? Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, there are suggestions about sort of obscure lost epics, like the, like the mountain, like the, um, the epic of Naupactus. Of which maybe eight words mm. I forget exactly how many it's like eight words of life, <laughs> you know, um, strange suggestions like this. Um, but it is a mystery. It is. It really is a mystery where that where that myth was was sort of kept and cherished uh, before it actually mm -hmm. ended up in in Apollonius. Um, mm -hmm. uh, oh gosh, no, I was going to say something else. <laughs> What was that? No. Oh yes, sorry. Yes, you mentioned that that wonderful the the the, the Duris the du, the Duris Cup, um, with mm. um, with Jason. Yeah, um, being yeah Hank being thrown up again <laughs> again. Yeah. Uh, here we come to dragons throwing things up. It's becoming a theme, isn't it? Being thrown up by the <laughs> by, by the dragon, uh, which and that's an episode which just simply does not um, appear at all in the literature. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I do, I do have a theory about what's going on there. Um, uh, I mean, why should why should the dragon have to throw Jason up? Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, he's going to be he's going to be thrown up. He's going to live again, you know, and he's going to get the fleece. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, obviously, at one stage it was looking very good for the dragon. Uh, um, well, again, I come back to Apollonius of Rhodes, and. Yet again, um, um, I'm uh, well. No, I was going to say I want to rearrange his episodes. In fact, I don't need to rearrange his episodes. Mm. But um, one of the episodes in that, um, so before Jason faces the fiery balls and the armed warriors, one of the very distinctive, memorable episodes in that is that uh, Medea. Um, um, smears him all over with a, an invincibility mm -hmm. lotion to protect him. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems to me that actually that may be the key to what's going on with the dragon spitting him, up, spitting him out. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe he's, he is imbued with this invincibility lotion at this point too, or still. Um, and, uh, and so the, the dragon can't digest him. So even though it succeeds in swallowing mm -hmm. him, it has to throw him up again. And as I say, he lives to fight another day. Um, that's my mm -hmm. that's my theory about uh, about what's going on there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that I mean, it, given Jason is helped by Medea in very important and vital ways throughout, that certainly makes sense that it would be another one of her actions that that you know helps him get out of the dragon exactly, yes. in whatever way because yeah he he does very little without her <laughs> without her help yeah. in the argonautica yeah. yes he's always being sidelined and if, if you if you look at the uh, the late antique orphic argonautica he's completely sidelined because orpheus basically orpheus becomes the star of that and uh mm -hmm. medea still has something to do but jason he really is a third wheel he just uh just uh hanging around doing not much yeah. yeah, yeah, he's interesting for that. Um, what Cadmus is is one of my favorites, and I'm realizing now it's been a really long time since I've actually like talked about him much on the podcast because because there's not there's not a lot of like long winded um, evidence for his stories or surviving pieces, but I find him so fascinating because he was such an Im important hero. 
uh, like in terms of, you know, as you were saying, he brought the alphabet mythologically and and metal, which I wasn't aware of. And I I love that connection between the the stone and then and the stone men growing up with with full armor on. Um, but I'm just curious about, I suppose this isn't a question so much as I just am interested in Cadmus and, and always curious for more. But I wonder if you just have any thoughts on on him as a character, given he does have these important aspects, but but is lacking much in the way of any like, you know, long epic story like like the rest of the more famous heroes. Um well not not really I'm afraid. Um uh, <laughs> Um, it was a stretch. <laughs> We're not talking about him. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, um, uh, I mean, I'm sure there would have been um, there would have been an awful lot of thieves in the epic cycle, um, mm -hmm. and um, yes, I mean, we do have a lot, an awful lot of sort of quite meaty Theban mythology still, don't we? Especially mm -hmm. in the tragedies. Um, but you're right. Yes, it's, yes, Cad Cadmus is a bit of a Cadmus is a bit of a hole in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and even from what I've heard about the the like missing Theban cycle, is it it does still seem to be more revolving around the Oedipus and the Seven Against Thebes bit. Sure. So all people who descended from Cadmus, but even still, it it seems like in the the lost works that we know are lost, mm. you know, versus everything sure. else, um, it still seems that he might be this kind of like missing character. And I just find him so fascinating for that. I guess just because he. He does have really important things attached to him, but without any real story that we know of as either surviving or or being missing. Um, Just like to theorize on Cadmus personally. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, well, 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 what we don't have is a yeah, as you say, is a sort of meaty recreation, you know. So we don't have a, you know, a, a Homeric account of Cadmus. We don't we don't have Cadmus mm -hmm. in tragedy. We don't even have a well. Um, He's in back Oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. Um, and then, and then there's and yes, uh, br yes, briefly, and there, and, and actually there's quite an interesting reference to him there. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously, we get a bit of get a bit of Ovid, a nice bit of Ovid mm -hmm. uh, about him. Um, and Nonus is sort of the big one, but he's so he's writing oh, so oh, late. Yes, Nonus yes, is Dionysia. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, you're a brave, you're a brave That's person a if, you can, if you can get through Nonus. <laughs> I've read all the Cadmus okay, bits of that, right, and it's okay, right, yeah, mind blowing. Sure. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yes, but you're right. You're right. He's, he doesn't really come across as a personality somehow, does he? Mm -hmm. um, but he is. Yes, he is interesting. I mean, he's. I mean, um, I mean, not 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 the least interesting fact about him is his is his end, isn't it? How how he ends up being transformed mm -hmm. into a into a dragon alongside alongside um, yeah. Harmonia. Um, you know, and one wonders, one wonders why that is. What's that all about? Mm -hmm. um, uh, that particularly because his his family is so cursed as well. So his his family is so cursed, and then they're turned into snakes. So they're almost not cursed. Is just a, a something I find quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, part. I mean, part. It might be um, that he has to make further compensation for killing the dragon, as it were, by sort of becoming a dragon in mm -hmm. its place. But, you th but then you mm -hmm. have to wonder about harmonia. Why does harmonia have to change too? You know, um, mm -hmm. and what happened between? I mean, how how is it that Cadmus could kill Ares' son, the dragon, mm -hmm. um, but then gets to marry Ares' daughter, Harmonia? Mm -hmm. What you know? Again, mm -hmm. what's going on there? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, yes. I mean, well, I mean the I mean the psychology. I'd like to. To see in all this is is actually Aries' psychology. <laughs> so. mm. That's I mean that's something I wonder about a lot generally. Yeah. <laughs> Aries is interesting. Well, and and I Harmonia is is the reason I developed an interest in Cadmus um, because I find her so fascinating. She's basically the only goddess who is you know a goddess on both sides. Of, by both her parents are incredibly important, like both Olympians. And yet she lives her whole life as a mortal with Cadmus. Mm. And I just think there must be some kind of reasoning there right. that we don't have, some kind of background, because that's fascinating to me. Yeah. Yes, I hadn't thought of that. But sure, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And again and again that sort of almost sort of intensifies the question as to why she has to end up as a dragon, doesn't it? 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, why is she not immortal? There's never an explanation for for why she would be living as a mortal and be able to, you know, that she doesn't get, you know, apotheosized like Heracles or anyone mm. else, given that she is like, she's equivalent to Eros in terms of parentage. Sure. But then she has this whole mortal story. And mm. yeah, she and she and Cadmus are my passion project. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just constantly looking for more about mm. them. Uh, well, I mean, this has been so incredibly fascinating i mean i'm thrilled to have have learned so much about these witches and and werewolves and dragons and snakes and and also cadmus so thank you for indulging me on my cadmus and harmonia yeah. talk yeah. <laughs> um yeah i really appreciate you speaking with me today really? thank you so much um is there anything you'd like to share with my listeners in terms of of you know your books or your work at all um well um yes it'll be a long time before <laughs> Before I produce another book, I'm afraid. I mean, I'm I'm at the bottom of the bottom of a sort of productive valley at this point. Um, I may or may not, um, at some point in the distant future, produce a sort of general general guide to to classical mythology, um, which is you have mm. done yourself. Um, uh, <laughs> um, but um, but no, uh, no, uh, no. I mean, my my most recent proudest productions are. The werewolf book, which you've uh, which you've mentioned, and then also this what we call the new the new dragon book, the th dragon three as I call it, yeah. um, the dragon in the west, <laughs> um, and um, yeah. So the last those are the two books I'd, I'd want to advertise at this point. Wonderful. Well, I'll I'll put them in the episode's description, and um, I plan to to air our conversation in around October when I love to do all of the spooky stuff and so i will be using all of your books again and my listeners yeah. can learn more about them that way and and I'll, I'll i'll share where to purchase them and everything because your books have been incredibly helpful to me in all my spooky season episodes yeah. so thank you for That's that very kind thank you uh well i was i'm thrilled to have you um yeah thank you thank you so much for okay. doing that great it's been a pleasure Oh, nerds, nerds, nerds. Thank you, as always, for listening. I fucking love spooky season. It is just so much fun to trawl all the ancient sources and characters for anything that I can even remotely relate to this topic. It's like a treasure hunt every year. And I've been using Daniel Logden's books for that treasure hunt for years now. So it was lovely to actually speak with him and learn about all these things even more directly. Especially that I got to talk about my new fascination, the vast difference between Greek witches and Roman witches. <sighs> Those Roman witches, man, they were really something else. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things, from running the YouTube to creating promotional images and videos to editing and research. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek myth and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron where you'll get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. As always, you all are the absolute best and I wouldn't be here without you. Thank you for listening. This coming Tuesday, the underworld. Chthonic cuties. I am Liv and I, I love this shit quite a bit. <laughs>